By the end of this video, you will have a comprehensive understanding of the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics, and you'll be able to easily read any textbook on this subject. So watch till the end. And let's begin. In classical physics, the mechanical state of an object is determined by Newton's equation, called the equation of motion, where F is the force acting on it, M is its mass, and A is its acceleration. If the force is unknown, then the acceleration is found by the basic laws of kinematics, where acceleration is given by. This speed is instantaneous speed, and is given at each moment by. Notice that speed and position must be measured to know the acceleration, and to write the equation of motion that describes the dynamics of the body. In fact, to find the force, we calculate acceleration in this way for several objects and for several examples, and derive from it the shape of the applied force. So, in classical physics, to know the dynamics of a body fully over time, we must know position and speed together simultaneously. In quantum mechanics, to describe a particle in spatial space, we add a large number of plane waves. A sine wave is a wave that can actually be written as, where i is the imaginary number, root of minus 1. Each of these plane waves has a perfectly defined momentum and wavelength, so we'll call it a momentum state, and in quantum mechanics it's called a momentum eigenstate. The word eigen from German means its own. By combining many of these waves, we ensure that we obtain the spatial particle representation that accompanies the wave representation of the particle. This causes the emergence of a compulsory uncertainty in the spatial mathematical representation of the particle. Notice that the wave packet of the particle has a spatial extension. It is not point-like, but rather, it contains a wavy phenomenon in it, the de Broglie wave, that results as the average of all these combined plane waves and has some extension over many position points. Due to this superposition also, its momentum is not defined by a single number. Hence, the classic requirement to know both speed, momentum, and location, simultaneously, is not satisfiable anymore. But what if we calculated the integral over all the values of k, or the momentum values, from negative infinity to positive infinity? What do we know about this integration? The exponential function within the integral is an imaginary function, whose real part is a cosine function. So at x equals 0, it equals to 1. For the rest of the other x values, it's periodic. On the entire x axis, all these plane waves of different wavelengths overlap and eliminate each other, but they only agree at x equals 0. There, they overlap on top of each other to give a very, very thin, but infinitely high function. This psi function is 0 everywhere, but only at x equals 0 is very high. It is a special function known as the delta function. If the state of a particle is mathematically represented by this function at some x0, then we would absolutely sure that the particle is at that point. Hence, we have now a very precise spatial mathematical representation of the particle. However, we used infinite number of momentum eigenstates, and our ignorance of momentum became also infinite. The particle may now have any momentum, both in direction and value. We call this delta function a position eigenstate. It will be denoted by psi sub x of x. The lower index means that it's a position eigenstate, while x in the parentheses means that it's represented in the position space. We can also get the momentum eigenstates by doing a similar integration. To find the position eigenstate, we integrated over all momentum eigenstates on the entire k-axis. So, if we want to have momentum eigenstate in the momentum space itself, we must reverse everything. First, we move on to the k-axis, or momentum space, by integrating over x values, and second, we find the representation of the position eigenstate in this momentum space. The position eigenstate in the momentum space is the reciprocal of momentum eigenstate in the position space, and we get a delta function in k-space. If this function were to mathematically represent the momentum of a particle, the particle's position becomes completely unknown, and it could be anywhere within the allowed space. But its speed, or momentum, is very specific at the point k0, where this delta function is located. It is a state of a certain momentum, momentum eigenstate. The results are summarized as follows. Where a and b are the position and momentum values that are different from zero. 
we now introduce the concept of the Hilbert space. Hilbert space can have an infinite number of dimensions, where each dimension represents an eigenstate of that space. The eigenstates of the Hilbert space form a set of basis vectors. These basis vectors span this space. Hilbert space is a complex vector space. That is, its own vectors have components that are complex numbers. It's an abstract space with state vectors that describe the physical states of the system. Notice, however, that the eigenstates, the delta function and the infinite plane waves, written earlier, cannot be elements of Hilbert space, because they are not normalizable. A feature will come to in a minute. However, other normalizable states can be built from combining them. There are two types of spaces. Continuous space and discrete space. Position space, for example, is a continuous space. Because it contains all possible locations at which a quantum particle could exist. Likewise, the momentum space. It's also a continuous space. However, a space like energy, for example, or spin space, these are discrete. That is, the states are not continuous. Instead, there are gaps between each pair of eigenstates, where the particle cannot occupy a state. Of course, the width of this separation depends on the studied system. The state vector of a Hilbert space is an abstract vector. We can represent it inside the position space, x, as a sum of all position eigenstates, the delta functions we just saw. But since these position eigenfunctions are so many, we use integration. The psi of x and t0 plays the role of some complex coefficients. Let's take x equals 3. We plug this into the integrand and we get a point. Now another x, say x equals 8. We get some another value, and so on. If we continue, we get this spatial representation of the state of the particle. And this is the wave function. It is the imaginary coefficient multiplied by the position eigenstate to determine how possible it is for the particle to be found at each location. The wave function of a wave packet is an integral, a superposition, of plane waves, which are the momentum eigenstates. This phi of k is the wave function represented in the k space, the momentum space. It plays also the role of the coefficients of the component waves. In addition, we can represent the entire wave function in the momentum space to get information about the particle's velocity and momentum. This is done by solving this integration. This method is called the Fourier transform. Notice that the velocity of the wave packet or the particle is also not certain. As you can see, it's also range of velocities or momenta. The relation between energy and momentum, or frequency and k, is called the dispersion relation. For a free particle, the energy is its kinetic energy, and it is. Where p equals h bar times k. Notice how the frequency is not linear with k. The group velocity of a wave packet is given by. So, we differentiate the dispersion relation and get. As you can see, it's a linear function in k, meaning each part of the wave packet has a different k value, hence, a different speed. This makes the wave packet disperse in a short time, just as a group of people walk at different speeds. After some time, they disperse from each other, and the group will get spread out. If the wave packet in the momentum space is narrow enough, then k doesn't change much inside its range. In the position space, the wave packet will be very wide, and so the dispersion will hardly be noticeable. In other words, the momentum of the particle is nearly certain at k0, but the position is highly uncertain. A quantum mechanical wave function should be quadratically integrable, meaning this integration should give a finite and real value, where psi star is its complex conjugate. This inside the integral is another function. It's a real function and it's called the probability density of particles' residence positions. If we plot it on the x-axis, it will tell us at which positions the particle is more or less likely to be found. We normalize the wave function so that the integration of this probability density over the entire allowed space yields 1. With every physical value that can be measured, like the position, the momentum, the energy, there exists a linear and real function called an operator. We denote these functions by a hat on the top. Remember the Hilbert space we mentioned? Well, I would like to think about the operator as the representer of some Hilbert space. The position space has a position operator. The momentum space, 
the energy space, and so on. Why I'd say that? The eigenstates of the operator are the eigenstates of the corresponding Hilbert space, and the number of these eigenstates are the number of the dimensions of this Hilbert space. All of the eigenstates of an operator form a complete and orthogonal normal, or orthonormal, basis states. Complete means that they cover all possible states the system can have, like all possible position or all possible energies, and orthogonal means that each eigenstate of an operator is a pure state. If we measure an isolated system by an operator, the state of that system will change to one of the eigenstates of that operator, and any subsequent measurement will yield the same result. We express this fact by what's called an inner product in that operator space. And this is the famous Kronecker delta symbol. If they are orthogonal, then this is zero, meaning the projection of psi sub n on psi sub m is zero. Otherwise, it will be non-zero if psi sub n is the same as psi sub m. If we normalize these psi's, then it would be one. If we have two operators, like the position operator and the momentum operator, then this here is called the commutator. It is a very, very important object in quantum mechanics theory, and it tells us whether we can know the two values of the measurements simultaneously or not. It's given by this formula applied to some wave function. The theory says, knowing exactly the position of the particle first, and then attempting to know exactly its momentum, or velocity, is different than knowing its velocity, and then attempting to know its position. This is because by knowing one of them using one operator, we drastically change the state of the particle to one of the eigenstates of that operator. For these two operators, we get a non-zero value, as expected from the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation seen earlier. The general uncertainty relation between any two operators is in terms of this commutator, and it's defined by the formula. If this commutator was zero, then there is no uncertainty between the operators A and B and they have the same set of eigenstates. In other words, they don't represent separate and distinct spaces as in the position-momentum case. The form of the operator depends on the space of representation. In the x-position space, the momentum operator is defined by the differentiation with respect to position. Example, let's take the momentum eigenstate in the position state. So we get, notice how the operator extracted the momentum value from the momentum wave function, and didn't change the state itself. This is because psi sub p of x is its eigenstate, one basis state in its own space of states. It's therefore great if we could represent the state in the operator space we want to apply. p is called the eigenvalue of the operator. An eigenvalue is always a real number, since it theoretically represents the result of a unique measurement. The energy of the system is given by a unique operator called the Hamiltonian operator. It's known from classical mechanics that energy is related to the symmetry of time. The total energy of a system stays the same for all times, unless some external force acted on the system. In quantum mechanics, this relation between energy and time evolution is represented by the Schrodinger equation. It is a central equation of quantum mechanics, since its solutions are the energy states of the system. We can also separate time from space and get the time-independent Schrodinger equation. If we have a large number of identical systems, each described by the same state function, psi, and if this was an eigenstate of some operator A, then the application of A will always yield the same corresponding eigenvalue of A, as we saw earlier. But if psi wasn't an eigenvalue of A, then, as we did in the wave packet, we represent psi of each system as a linear combination of the eigenstates of the operator A. These coefficients are the projections of the state psi on each of the eigenstates that belong to A. And then we act by A on the sum. We multiply by the complex conjugate of this state. Now we apply A on its eigenstates phi sub I. It will yield a different eigenvalue for each system. If we distributed the first sum on the second one, then, because of orthogonality, only those terms, where i is equal to j, will survive, and so, we can write this as one sum, this is the probability of getting the eigenstate phi sub i, and this is the average or the expectation value of the operator in these discrete eigenstates. In the case of continuous eigenstates the relation becomes, and here's the probability density, psi star psi. It is the very same formula of calculating the average value. 
in general. Now it's time to talk about what's called Dirac notation. It's a very elegant and powerful notation for the math of quantum mechanics. The first element in this notation is the so-called Dirac vector. It represents a quantum state in abstract Hilbert space. All what's there to know physically about the system or the particle is contained in this Ket state vector. And it's the representation of this ket in other spaces what allows us to extract information from it about the position, momentum, spin, etc. The complex conjugate vector to it is called a bra vector. Denoted like this. The ket vector represents a column vector. The bra vector is its conjugate transpose of it. And it's a row vector. The inner product we saw earlier can now be written as and the complex conjugate of it is written by flipping the bra and the ket, and add an asterisk. The inner product yields a complex number, and provides a measure of the similarity between two quantum states. If they are orthogonal to each other, it gives zero. This corresponds to the form earlier seen. The probability of an eigenvalue A to occur is written by this. An operator acts on a ket vector yields another ket but an operator can act also on a bra vector and yields another bra. If the same ket was turned into a bra by complex conjugating it, then this operator acts on it and yields the bra corresponding to the resulting ket. Since an operator in quantum mechanics is Hermitian, its eigenvalues are real numbers. So it can act to the left and to the right, meaning on the bra and on the ket. That is great because if we have something like this, where H is the Hamilton operator of the energy, k is an energy eigenstate of h, and psi some state, then we can simply apply h on its eigenstate, and get a simple number, its energy eigenvalue. The last thing to mention is the projection operator. Suppose you have an abstract ket vector, and you want to represent it in some space, say the position space. What you do is you insert the identity operator. This is called the outer product now and this whole thing is called the identity operator of the basis. Notice what happens here. This is the same formula we encountered earlier when we defined the position wave function. This applies to all other bases of other spaces. You are now ready to dive into any quantum mechanics textbook and actually understand the equations in it. Please don't forget to follow the channel. Thanks for watching.